You guys hear me all right? Yeah, it's good. I, I, I should clarify, I was sick earlier this week, and so I, I'm a bit of a germaphobe, and so if I sound a little bit funny, I am better that my voice is just lagging behind, so apologies for that. Uh, can I pray for us? And look at the Bible. Our Father, we thank you so much for your word, that it is rich, it's good for the Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that this morning we might see his glory and that we might respond to him as our Lord and our Saviour. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, up on the screen is a couple of pictures. I wonder, is anyone else a fan of disaster movies here? No one. <laughs> We've got, got two people. That's good. See, I, I found this out about myself over the last few years that I really like disaster movies. And the thing is, they're terrible. <laughs> the script is really, really bad. I, I haven't found a good disaster movie. But I find when I'm on holidays and I've got nothing to do, I'll watch a disaster movie more often than not. And I reckon I've cracked the script. The, here's the genre. You take an actor who used to be good, <laughs> and they're in their middle age, and th they have an ex-wife, and she's got some kids. And a disaster happens that brings them together and they save the world. That sounds familiar to about 100 movies. But it's great. And here's the thing. In each movie, amidst the dreadful script, there is one moment that I, I take it is quite profound, which is the moment when they uncover the truth. One of my favourite disaster movies is Dante's Peak. Anyone seen Dante's Peak? Yeah, a few. It's a lovely 80s movie. Harry Dalton, a volcanologist, is, is sent to Dante's Peak, the sleepy town, and he finds that the volcano there is about to blow. And there's this moment in the movie where he speaks to his boss and he says, your volcano might just be waking up. Lovely script, isn't it? Nice and understated. But Les, his boss, says, you're talking about the evacuation of 7,400 people. Don't you think that's a little extreme? And here's the thing. There is this moment when the truth comes out and something needs to happen. That the truth is so big that you can't stay where you are. You can't stay in the town because the volcano is going to blow. You have to do something. I take it it's a very compelling human moment. And in a sense, I want us to have that moment this morning. That as we see Jesus, we see his claims, who he is, that we can't stay where we are. Because the truth, if it's true, is so big about who Jesus is that we have to do something. If it's true, it demands a response. It is so big. And the bigger the truth, actually, the bigger the response that's needed. Am I echoing a little bit? Is that just me? Yeah, it's good. We'll keep going. <laughs> Here's where I want to go. I want to open Luke 9 for us, which is the, the gospel account that we've been working through. And I want to ask three questions with you, which is, who is Jesus? Why did he come? And then what does it mean to follow him? First, who is Jesus? Have a look down at verse 18. It would be a great help if you've got your Bible open in front of you. Verse 18, now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah. And others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. You see, Jesus is with his disciples and he asked them the question, the right question, who do people say that I am? You notice how much Jesus makes that about himself? Who do people say that I am? The disciples answer, well, well some say Elijah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. They might feel like they're not your answers, <laughs> might be a little bit weird, but here's what's going on, I think, is that as people saw Jesus, his power was undeniable. 
I wonder if you were here for the Mark drama. Anyone here for the Mark drama? Yeah. How good is it to see the extraordinary account of Jesus' life? And as you see that, and, and it's been here in Luke as well, he has done extraordinary miracles. He has raised the dead. He's healed the sick. This is not any man. This is not a mere man, is it? And, and the, the crowds knew it. Everyone who saw him knew he was someone significant. But who? Well, he's someone from God, but we don't really know. And I take it there's not a lot that's changed in 2,000 years. You go out and ask the people of Maroubra, who is Jesus? Well, he's someone. <laughs> he's someone significant, but I don't exactly know. But look at how much time Jesus gives that question. He actually just ignores it. He asks the disciples the question and then he ignores it and verse 20 says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? I want to suggest that is the question that really matters. Not who do they say that Jesus is, but who do you say? This morning, I wonder who do you think Jesus is? What do you make of him? Peter's answer is astonishing. He says, the Christ of God. That is a massive answer. See, the disciples have been with Jesus for a while now. They know he is not just a prophet. He is not John the Baptist. In fact, they saw John the Baptist, and he is the one who is greater than John. Who is this that raises the dead? Peter says, this is the Christ, the Christ of God. Now, in that claim is an astonishing, that is an astonishing claim. But in order to kind of work out what it means, we need to do a little bit of work. See, in the Old Testament, God had spoken through the prophets of one who would come, the anointed one, the son of God. See, the word Christ just means anointed one. As someone would proclaim a king, they would anoint them with oil. And the Jews came to expect through a bunch of prophecies that there would be one who would come who would be the great Christ, the King, the Lord. One of the key passages is what we read before, Psalm chapter 2. Feel free to stay in Luke 9, but let me read a couple of, of things for us. In Psalm 2, you can flick there if you'd like to. Psalm chapter 2, we, we see this figure who is before the nation. They are raging against him. They take their stand. And yet the Lord's anointed, verse 2, is the one who has all authority, the one who smashes them with a rod of iron. This is the Lord. It's an enormous prophecy, the one who is the Lord of the universe, the King, the Son of God. And at this point in history, the Jews were longing for this one to come. See, the Assyrians had taken out the northern empire. After that, the Babylonians took Judah off into exile. They came back. The Greeks had them in captivity. Then the Romans, as we read now. And that, these were precious prophecies that one who would come would free God's people, the Christ. Do you see the significance when Peter says, you are the Christ? This is Jesus. But our passage actually goes further. See, first, Jesus' identity is confessed, but then it's actually revealed. Have a look down at 28, verse 28 of Luke 9. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. His clothing became dazzling white. It's an extraordinary account, isn't it? That as Jesus came up on the mountain, his face was changed. His clothes were like lightning. It's like, it, it, it's like John and Luke and Mark. All, all of those who saw the glory of Jesus, they just reached for something. <laughs> it was like lightning. It was glorious. Matthew says his face shone like the sun. See, here we get a glimpse of who Jesus really is. It's like the veil has been lifted back 
And what is there is glory. Blinding glory of the Christ. Moses and Elijah are there with him. It's like the culmination of the law and the prophets. The great ones of the Old Testament are there and they all point to this one, the Lord. What's going on? Have a look at verse 32. Now Peter and those who were with him were were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. They saw his glory. This is not the reflected glory of another. See, here's the thing. Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament both saw the glory of Yahweh in the mountain at different times. And here, they see the glory of the Son of God. And it is blinding. It's astonishing. This is who Jesus is. And as he stands here, the voice thunders from heaven, this is my Son. Do you see who he is? This is the Christ of God, the Lord. Come as a man. Now when you get that, I want to suggest it changes everything. If this really is who Jesus is, nothing can be the same. This is the Lord, the Christ, the one who holds the whole universe in his hands. A couple of years ago, I... My, my wife and I were catching up with a, a lady. I, I used to work in student ministry. And I remember she wanted to read the Bible with us because she found Jesus compelling, but she just hated the Bible. And so that's tricky, right, when you want to read the Bible with someone and they don't like it. <laughs> and so the first time we met, she still had the glitter from the Mardi Gras the night before on her face. And I, I was just nervous. You know, you, you're going, I don't know what, what was going to happen. But as we started reading the Bible, we read it for about a year. And over the months, she started to find Jesus more and more compelling. It's like she just couldn't shake him. But then she started to find him really, really offensive. Remember, she said to me, he asks too much of me. His claims are too big. It was like she didn't want to have anything to do with him. But as we kept reading, she became persuaded it was true. And I caught up with her last year to to talk about what happened, and, and she said this, I kept coming back to the Bible, and I was convinced that what Jesus was saying was true. She became persuaded. And when that happened... She said, I first understood it in my head and then the beauty of Jesus captured my heart. And it has been a wonderful thing to see her life transformed over the last few years. But that's what happens, isn't it? When you see Jesus, when you see who he is, when you believe it, it ought to change us because it changes everything. This is the one before whom every knee will bow. But why did he come? When you get the answer to that question, it is staggering. Have a look at verse 22. Peter has just confessed, you are the Christ of God, and then Jesus says this. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised... See, why did Jesus come? He says to suffer, to be rejected, to be killed. Isn't that astonishing? See, have we heard this too much and our hearts grow cold? Why did the Christ come to die? To be rejected by the very nations that he was meant to rule over. Take a closer look at the transfiguration with me. This is the moment, I take it, when Jesus' glory, aside from his resurrection, is most visible. What, what's it there for? Have you ever wondered that? You read the transfiguration, you go, what's going on? What's the point? One of the ways to answer that is, what's the point for Jesus? Why is Jesus there? And I take it our passage tells us. Have a look at verse 30. Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus. They're actually speaking on the mountain. What are they speaking about? Verse 31. 
they spoke of his departure, which he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. His departure, his death is what he's speaking about. Isn't that astonishing? As he's revealed in his glory for who he is with Moses and Elijah, what do they speak about? They're preparing him for his death and his resurrection and ascension to the Father. This is so central to who the Lord Jesus is. The Christ came to die. Why? Why would the Lord come to die? Well, there's a clue in the words from God spoken in the cloud. Have a look at what God says. This is my Son whom I have chosen. See, as God speaks those words, he's drawing together old words that he has already spoken in the Old Testament. The first is, my son, Psalm 2, this is the Christ, this is the one. But the second prophecy is from Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 verse 1 says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. Do you see what's going on? Is that God is drawing things together about who Jesus is. Now the suffering servant songs of which Isaiah 42 is one, speak of one who would come, not to rule but to die, to die for the sins of Israel, who would be rejected. The most famous of these songs is Isaiah 53. And it speaks of one who would be despised and rejected a man of sorrows, one who the Lord would lay the sin of all, who would die for the people. Because here's the thing, Jesus is the Christ, but he didn't come to release the Jews from the Romans. That's what they were expecting. He actually came to deal with a greater problem. See, the Christ is the suffering servant. They are one. And the greatest problem facing Israel was actually their hearts. It's the same problem that we face, is that each of us have turned away from God, that we've lived life our own way. It's what the Bible calls sin, that we live in God's world but decide that we want to live life our own way. We can take his stuff, but actually I'm not going to follow the Lord who made me. When you think about that, that is a big problem, isn't it? We've actually said to God, get stuffed. And when you do that to God, there are consequences, right consequences, because he is the Lord, and we live in his world. And the Bible says the consequences are we're cut off from the Lord who gives life, that we face death and judgment. We are in way over our heads on our own, aren't we? But do you see what this passage is saying? That the Christ came to die to deal with that problem, to deal with our sin. And as we celebrated Easter last week, that's exactly what Jesus did. He went, the Christ went to the cross and he died. Why did he do it? To save you. Because as he died on the cross, he took all of our sin on himself. All of it. So that as he dies, he dies in your place. That your sin is placed on him so that if you trust in him, you're completely forgiven from everything you've ever done. That is at the heart of the Christian message, isn't it? That the Christ came to suffer and die. There's a picture up on the screen of a a man. Uh, Does anyone know who this is? His name was Bill Deacon. In 1997, he was a helicopter rescue guy. I don't know exactly what you'd call his job, but he was in a helicopter and he rescued people, right? (laughs) And there was a ship called the Green Lily and it was in trouble. There was a big swell off the coast of North England and the people were about to die. They, they, They couldn't get out. They couldn't get the rafts out and they were about to be swept onto the rocks. And so Bill Deacon and the helicopter come in and he's winched down and he starts bringing the men up into the helicopter. Eleven of them. And as he comes to the final ones, he realises that time's running out 
And so he unclips himself and he places it on the last man and they're winched to safety. And the report sees as they watch on from the helicopter, the waves sweep over the boat and Bill Deacon dies. It's a tragic story, isn't it? It's a true story. But I take it it gives us just a glimpse of the far more profound rescue that the Christ, the Lord Jesus, would come down and that he was swept into the wrath of God for us. This is real, this happened, and it is extraordinary. That the divine son came into our world, the one whose glory was veiled so that he would die. Do you see him as he is? What a God, what a saviour this is that he would come and die for us. See, the one whose face shone on the mountain was crowned with thorns. The one whose clothes were like lightning hung naked on a cross for you. The one who stood between Moses and Elijah in glory was hung between two criminals as he died. And the one who is the light of the world, who stood on the mountain as the voice said, this is my son, and cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is our Lord. He is the Christ, the one who died for us. What will you do with him? Who will you live for? That's the question Jesus asks earlier in our passage. Have a look at verse 23. Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory. You see what's going on? Jesus presents us with a terrifying choice. Verse 26, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory. See, there is a day when Jesus is coming back. He is the Christ of Psalm 2. He is the Lord of all, and there will come a day when Psalm 2 comes true in its fullness, when he judges the whole earth. On that day, we will all have to give an account to him, to the Christ. Psalm 2 will be fulfilled. And Jesus says on that day, if you are ashamed of him now, he will be ashamed of you. In other words, eternity is real. Heaven and hell are real. And Jesus puts it up front, you have two choices, to live for him or to live for yourself. Eternal life or eternal judgment. This is the disaster movie moment. It is real. What will you do? And I want to suggest, if Jesus is who he says he is, if he's the Christ, if he came to die, and I'm persuaded that's true, you cannot stay where you are. There is too much at stake. Eternity is real. And Jesus says, come. See, if you live for yourself, you will save your life now, Jesus says but you will forfeit your soul. Is that a price you're willing to pay? What good is it, Jesus says, to gain even the whole world and yet forfeit your very soul? But hear the wonderful words of hope, verse 24. Jesus says, the one who lives for him will save their life for eternity. Now, it'd be a pretty good idea to work out what that means. What does it mean to live for Jesus? Well, verse 23, he tells us it's to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Whoever wants to be my disciple must first deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. See, at the heart of being a Christian is this, that I live for Jesus, not for myself. Not perfectly, limping along, but following him 
and living for him. See, when you become a Christian, your whole life changes. That no longer do I seek to live for me, but for him. At its heart, Jesus is saying, are you going to live for yourself or for me? I wonder if you're here this morning and you haven't decided yet. Maybe you came on Easter and then this is all quite full on and you're thinking, oh, I want to know a little bit more, I'm not sure. Can, can I encourage you to go to the Life Series, if that's you? First of May. Is there dinner? Did I hear as well? There's supper. How good supper? First of May, supper. I, I take it, as an adult, one of the best things you can do is to investigate the claims of Jesus for yourself. Can I commend that to you? Can I suggest as well, if you're here this morning and you've been a follower of Jesus for a while and you're tired, finding it hard, keep going. You know, the key to following Jesus is to remember who he is, what he's done, and let that change your heart by the Holy Spirit. It is worth it. See, our world tells us an entirely different message, doesn't it? That live for yourself, live for what makes you happy, do what feels right. And Jesus comes along and says, come and follow me. And that's hard. But it's worth it. So keep going until he takes us home. I want to leave us with an encouragement that there's this wonderful verse in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It's up on the screen says this, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. What a promise that is, hey, that when Jesus takes us home, he will, and we will be there with him for eternity. Can I pray as we finish? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, for who he is, that he is the Christ, that he is the Lord. We pray that as we go out this week that you would convict us afresh of these things and that we might live for you, that we might love the Lord Jesus more and more as we see the day approaching when he will take us home. Amen.